very warm welcome to the Gala's first ever webinar this evening, and thank you all for joining us. I believe we have about 227 people now that's joined us. So thank you all for being here this evening. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, my name is Violet McLean, and I'm, I manage the galleries here at the university. And I hope you enjoyed the slideshow prior to me coming online. Uh, for those who couldn't get to see the exhibition, I hope you've got an opportunity to see more ex exhibition to the stills that we've been showing on the slideshow. As you can see, we're zooming in from the gallery and I'm sitting in Morg's exhibition in the lower gallery. I thought it was very important to have the exhibition as part of the event this evening. So sorry about the echo. There's a little bit of echo because I'm in the lower gallery. And we are sorry that not as many people got to see the exhibition as we would have hoped for because of lockdown and the government restrictions. Um, I'm just going to run through tonight's uh, format with you all, but before I start, I'd like to bring your attention to the kimono that I'm wearing. It's been designed by Mara Marscroft and is part of her Temple of Curiosity project, which you can read about in our social media posts on Facebook and Instagram. Um, the event will run for about an hour this evening, which will include questions. Um, we, we ask that you're sitting comfortably and you've got yourself a glass of wine or a cup of tea, whatever is your preference. Uh, for those who wish to have a comfort break, may I ask you to please do so now. This is where I normally say uh, there are no planned fire alarms this evening for this event, but should I say perhaps there are no planned far, uh, power cuts that I'm aware of. Um, a number of questions have already been received by our students, which will be asked by Sally at the end of her conversation with Morai. We hope to take maybe one to two questions from the chat, if time permits, um, so please bear with us on that one. Um, I'm delighted to say that Morag is zooming in from London and Sally's zooming in from the gallery office. I feel I'm a bit of a, in a Star Trek movie when I say that, uh, those who remember that from their childhood. Um, with that said, again, a very, very warm welcome to the gallery's first ever webinar. So it now gives me great pleasure to invite our principal and vice chancellor, Pre Professor Paul Goff, to say a few words of welcome, Professor. Thank you, Violet. Thank you. I mean, Violet, I feel very underdressed given what you're wearing. I'm, I'm embarrassed that you and Sally and Morag are dressed in the most extraordinary gear. So um, I'm, I'm feeling a bit remiss. Uh, I'll see if I can get a costume change during the course of the interview. But it's great to see you all. Uh, I'm delighted to host this event with 220, 249 people out there, which is just wonderful, wonderful. So it's wonderful to be associated with the gallery here at AUB and to hear from Morag, who was awarded an honorary fellowship by us in 2012. Now, if you've seen the exhibition or if you've been looking at the slides, you're instantly struck by the kind of vigor, the vitality, but also the passion and that sense of genuine collaboration that Morag brings to all of her work. And those very words are core to the values of the university. And our new strategy talks about working in partnership with others, creating community and bringing a passion to our learning, teaching, engagement and research. And as you'll hear, or I have already read, Morag talks so eloquently about belonging, about falling in love with a sense of place, about reimagining it, opening our eyes to the fresh potential in places we might otherwise walk straight past. And belonging is such a powerful force here at AUB, belonging to the community and the campus, both physically and digitally like we are now, belonging to our disciplines and our professions, belonging to each other. And so who better to talk to us about sites of belonging than Morag, whose mantra I've just read online is make happy those who are near and those who are far. Morag was born and bred in Holloway in North London. She's always lived in the city. She's been fascinated by how color, pattern and words can instantly change, transform urban environments and then see for herself and for others that she collaborates with, those thousands of people that know her and know her work, how it changes and impacts on their perceptions of the way that spaces can become places. And as you've seen, and you'll see now, her strong visual approach is instantly recognizable. It elevates every context where it's placed. It creates a sense of joy and belonging for all those who encounter it. And this has been realized through exhibitions, through commissions, through site-specific work in every corner of the globe. There she has created distinctive 
local responses to every single site she works on and to each audience, whether it's in schools or hospitals or cultural hubs or town centres. So I'm delighted to invite Sally, Sally Hope, who co-created the remarkable exhibition at AUB to join Morag so that we can share and live for a while in that wonderful world of her imagination, her insights and her experience. So thank you very much for joining us and over to Sally and to Morag. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you to Violet and Will, especially for all their hard work in getting the exhibition together. It's been a fantastic achievement. Thanks to everyone. Um, welcome to everyone joining us tonight. Now I've got 259 people out there, so um, I'm sorry that we can't see you, but um, hopefully um, you've all managed to see an element of Morag's exhibition. It's quite a poignant exhibition for me because it's actually been four years in the planning and the making, and then <laughs> when we get to March, it, you know, we sadly went into lockdown, but it's also quite a, a spiritual place for me as well, because when things did get to start a bit hairy in March, I'd, I'd had a bit of a crap day. I sort of went and spent 10 minutes in the exhibition and it became a sort of place of solace, but also the sort of context, as Paul says, we make belonging, a sort of beacon of hope for the future. So, um, you know, that, and it was really nice to come back onto campus and see that. And it, obviously that is the epitome of everything that Morag is and AUB is as well. So, right. So sort of I had a number of questions from students that I now have in my be a kind of superhero um, questions in here, which I'll draw out at random later, um, which was a project that Morag did in, with, in good company with lots of other artists over lockdown to celebrate um, the frontline workers. So I suppose um, I've had a number of questions, really that compendium of practice that you have across working with architectural practices to community groups, to festivals. Do you start all of those projects quite differently or the same? Do you have a sort of routine or what? Tell us more about those experiences. Okay. That's a big one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. <laughs> and thank you for coming to listen to us tonight. Um, okay, so I have not heard these questions in advance. So I am just going to answer them straight, you know, from just here <laughs> now. So, um, so big question, how do I start my projects? How do I start my projects or how do I work them all together or... How do you start your projects? Let's start with that one. That'd be great. That'd be st let's start with a bite-sized bite -size project. How do I start, start with projects? Um, well, I mean, I've been working a really, really long time. So um, I've got a, you know, a lot of things, experience in my head about how to make things and physical things. But I think the hardest thing that I always find when I'm, usually emailed or um, rung up about a project the moment they speak to me me about it I just love it straight away I'm so excited I want to do it and it's brilliant and I'm going to do you know it's going to be so amazing and then I sit down at um, think find the time to start working on it and then I can't do anything at all like I don't know how to start and and every project I have a little bit of that so I have to sort of find a way of how do I start make putting uh make a mark on the paper or or getting what i my thoughts or my excitement that i initially had out and actually the thing that i found is it's not always about making that work at that particular time i may have been thinking about something a while ago so i keep a sketchbook and often when i travel I draw when my mind is a little bit more open and it's not so worried and anxious about answering something. I often, I, I, build, I draw structures, I draw shapes, I like drawing doorways, I like doing things like that. And, um, and then I'll, I'll sort of, when I start doing a project and I'll go back and look at those drawings and then I start thinking about how they it's a sort of a flow of work and how they connect in and then I might take fragments of the new work and then fragments of old work because because I make I have a sort of continuity with my work I can um uh, I don't have to start from absolutely fresh each time you know when you're designing when I used to be more of a 
um, do wayfinding and things. You have to start fresh. You have to enter your mind. And I used to think of myself as a, um, a, a method actor then. So I would empty my brain and I'd absorb everything around me and then I would just let it out. But the work I do now is a very different way of using my brain. It has a continuity and then I'm, while, while I'm going on, I want to do different things. So there are different ways of working and your brain works in different ways for different things. Okay. So, so how, how many sketchbooks do you have? You've got like a, a library full of sketchbooks. No, no, I'm not very, um, oh, I've got one in front of me. Where is it? I am not very prolific with my sketchbook, actually. Um, but um, I, uh, so here's some things, but I just sit, so there might be notes on one side and then I'll draw things like that when, and I usually when I'm traveling, but I haven't been traveling this year. But so I'm not a person, I don't put things in my sketchbook. I just draw in my sketchbook. Um, yeah, just like different things, just draw. Okay. And um, your project in Aberdeen, Love at First Sight, was a sort of a, a, a collaborative, a very altruistic approach to collaboration with community groups. And obviously very poignant to you because that's a homage to your mom and dad because that's where they first met. Mm. How, you know, you're sort of working with 30 volunteers, all making and creating work. Do you ever want to go, ah, oh, <laughs> or, you know, how do you sort of like control, you know, manage it, I suppose, project manage? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It depends on the project. Um, so it depends on the different types of involvement. So at the very beginning, for Love at First Sight, um, it was very much a collaborative project in the sense that um, the content of it was not going to be about my mother and father, but about... Um, Aberdeen and, um, and, and the community. And then I worked with the poet Jo Gilbert, a Doric poet, and we, she was the one who sort of drew it out of me and said, more but there's a double narrative here. Um, you, you know, why don't we also have the story of your parents? Whereas I was a bit unsure about whether I wanted to do the story of my parents, you know, because I was doing a community project. But actually, I think uh, work is stronger when you ha do have a real connection to it as well. And uh, so when we did this double narrative, so then Joe worked with the community and did a jigsaw poet poem about why dear Aberdeen, why they love Aberdeen. And they, and that was really the big part of the sort of creative part of the community side. But then the structure, I, I designed that structure as a, um, as a response to the whole project. And then I worked with a load of people to help me paint the structure. So um, it was a sort of a collective, there's different ways of making the work. Whereas at the moment I'm working on amazing project, um, uh, um, I can never remember the names of the um, Adventure Playground and that one I am just the facilitator I sort of is just going to make that it will be their work and I will help make that happen so it totally depends on the project so Love at First Sight was more you know you can see me a lot in it mm. and, and other ones you, you, I don't want you to see me so much. <laughs> it's not about me. It's about me helping make these things happen. And also people want some of me in it as well. You yeah. know, when we're working together, you're often chosen. Sometimes you're chosen by communities for projects and they want you for a reason. You know, they want to make a piece of work with you. And, and so again, there's no formula. Right. Okay. That's good. And your, one of your most recent, your recent work that's now in Paris, A New Now. Oh, yeah. It's really in on your Instagram feed, <laughs> which glows in the dark. <laughs> it, glows, it glows. I always do a bit of glow in the dark. Yeah. On your Instagram feed, it gives a really good account of actually how long it actually takes you to produce each panel. And, and, yes. And do you, obviously your studio, you live above the shop, so to speak, and then you've got this lovely studio underneath. 
You so said, how long did that project literally take you to sort of paint? So um, that took me, because um, often that's another thing, I, when in not COVID times, I love it when I can pay people to help me paint because I'm getting quite old now. <laughs> and I don't like painting continually. I don't really. <laughs> um, but in Paris, that project in Paris, also I like it if it's painted in the city that it's being made, so it isn't shipped out. So if it had been normal times, I would supervise the people to paint it in Paris and I would have helped paint. As it was, the project wasn't going to happen, so I had to paint it on my own in the studio, which was, was nice, it was nice to do. It takes me three weeks to do that piece. Um, there was 40 boards, I think. I am very, very meticulous and very, very methodical. And um, I, you know, each board would have been maybe 20 workings because you have to tape and Da -da -da. you have to put the undercoat you've got to tape it's got to last outside da -da -da -da. so it's it's a lot of a lot of layering per board but once it's all about space if you've got a big space you can paint you know six boards in a day or something you know because you can move around so you have to be really systematic mm. and you have to remember what you're doing and everything you know and I have I mean I've done that when I did this big project in um, Sweden um, uh, of my tweets I had like um, 10 to 15 people sometimes in the studio and, you know, we had to absolutely have this meticulous system of who's painted what, how many layers they've painted, because to keep the flow going, you have to keep on moving around. So it's, um, yeah, it, that's why, you know, because I did a lot of wayfinding. I, I know how to do systems. That's another part of your brain, a different part of your brain. And yeah. you're very meticulous about particular paint brands and rollers like lots of artists get yeah caught. yeah I'm very meticulous about everything yes hmm. <laughs> it is a bit of a military operation <laughs> the paint that arrived in the gallery was quite a phenomenal experience really <laughs> all these different colors um, so yeah so um We've got some questions from students now. I sort of like M from Viscom is quite interested in how you actually devise your quite striking typographic forms. Um, do, you, do you sort of do, do you generate them on the computer? Do you sketch them out by hand? And then how do you sort of scale, scale up your work from starting, small starting points to larger points as well? Okay, so I, I use my computer at like a scale thing. I always work in one to 10. Um, if I'm doing something large, I, um, or one, one to 10, one to a hundred, but you know, one to um, an, an understanding. So, because if you start, you know, architects will do one to mm. 30 or I, I can't one to 25. I mean, in my head, I can't like, I don't understand one to 25. I can't work that out. So I know that if something is 10 centimeters, it becomes one centimeter and I'm that, you know, I, I can understand that. So I always work in that system unless I'm forced in another way. And anyway, when I'm often working with, if I do work with architects, they give me plans. I always put their plans <laughs> into my one to 10 or something. And so, so, and often on big buildings, it's one to a hundred. So I will work maybe in on two meter files or something, depending on how big the thing is, because I understand that. And I have a, I do, uh, under, I can absolutely translate in my head what I'm doing on the screen to what is gonna, what I know exactly how it's gonna appear when it's, it's outside. Um, I think that you should always, uh, it's, if you don't understand that so easily, you should always put a figure in your work so if you're doing something really big you should always put just a little person next to that work and then Im immediately your brain will connect to who you standing in that room next to that big thing sort of thing um with the type yes i tend to draw the type i i've always regretted when i was at st martin's royal college nobody taught me how to draw type <laughs> it is, uh, it is my, a, a big limitation of mine and so um, I draw my type on the, um, on the computer um, I, I do everything in Illustrator um, I build my structures in SketchUp because I work in 3D then um, 
I'll sometimes sketch my drawings, but not, I don't go into full detail of um, sketches of type. I tend to just do that straight on the computer. Okay. Um, yeah, I do all my own artwork and everything. So is that, does that answer that one? Yeah, I, think that, I think that's a really good answer and really helpful for the students as well. Yeah. Sort of like tips and figures and scaling, because scaling is complicated, isn't it? Mm. Um, another uh, student, Rachel, also from Viscom, she said, how did, you, how did you decide where the work went in the gallery in the spaces and how they sort of interconnected? Because it's, it's quite a large scale sort of installation and you were sort of working quite remotely to sort of place everything. Um, and obviously you've been to the gallery previously. So yeah. thinking where the plants and the structures went and the sort of, because it's a fascinating exhibition of different, you know, ways of work. You've obviously got your working process, photographs, family, sort of real homage, you know, to everything that you've achieved. So, yeah. So, so I mean, I understood the space. And one thing I think that's very important when you do work is you should it, go and see, you know, experience a space, understand the atmosphere. That might be something outside or inside. Sometimes when I work, I can't always travel to the place, but people will send me videos so I get the atmosphere or something. But in the gallery, fortunately, I had been previously. I did know the space it is a unique layout so you remember it so I did remember it um Violet and Will were really helpful and they sent me photographs and everything so that I could make sure I had floor plans so I worked with a floor plan um I then drew it up in SketchUp as well and then positioned the things where I wanted them but the most important thing for me was I wanted to really visualize um, the connection with my work, with my upbringing, and how that is so informs my work now, how they can't really be separated out. And that's why when I did draw up every single position of where the poor, poor Violet Will and the whole team putting it up, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, because everything wanted to be next to something else, because there was a reason why I put that picture, there's a picture of me up the ladder next to my French grandmother, and that's sort of very poignant, because she's not that, we're of a similar age at that point of her life and my life, and it was that's her, fan, her French salon that she had in Holloway that was a sort of fantasy. And then there's me up a ladder with my fantasy, <laughs> you know, which is my um, structure. So, you know, each of the pictures all around are all, you know, connected to each other. And, and that, that did actually take me quite a while. Um, but I feel really um, lucky that you gave me the opportunity to do that. Uh, and then, and the other big important part about the exhibition is everything was reused. Mm. So there's bits of my bandstand make my, my escape hut. And then there's different, you know, there's things from test uh, colors that I've done for things. There's, you know, lots of materials from, from my projects, tiles and stuff. And I didn't want to, Apart, I, I, apart from some two by two wood, I didn't want to go, you know, make things that then would either have to be thrown away or um, would have to have a home because this is all going to come back to me. So it's on its way tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you ever sort of recycle parts from past installations into new installations or? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a big storage space, actually, with um, a lot of the things in the Temple of Agape. And um, at the moment, I'm doing a big uh, piece in Grosvenor where I had some lots of wood cut, but I didn't use it. So I'm using all my off cuts um, so I don't throw anything away. And I am planning an, uh, um, an installation, maybe that's going to be in Belgium. So we will have to travel the stuff by car by roads but uh where we get, we will build the whole thing from my existing um panels and so yeah you, i like reusing yeah and do you have to get like sort of structural engineers in to sort of like do calculations for things 
you know, oh, yeah, I work with structural. Yeah, exactly. I work with structural engineers. When, when I work on my temporary projects, um, if you work with a, a, a structural engineer that builds buildings, they will um, over give, give you a structure that is going to last, you know, that you, I don't know, that you could um, last forever. Um, well, you want it to last forever. You don't want it to fall on anybody. But so I went, I tend to work with temporary engineers who do temporary structural work. So more scaffold engineers and things. And then it's leading on got a, from Anastasia from architecture is really interested in your collaboration with really quite large architectural practices, a HMM, David J. And, you know, you do a lot of architectural work. Is that something quite different to the community projects or it's the sort of same type of? I mean, I, I did. I mean, I, I did a lot of, um, you know, the are well, Sally, I did a lot of environmental uh, graphics in schools and I, I sort of one, of one of the earlier people who started showing the value of integrating work into schools and with, with Alford Hall Monaghan Morris and we won the Sterling Prize in 2015 for our, our Burntwood School. Um, I, um, and for David Ajay, I, I worked on his exhibition um, at the um, Design Museum, but that's all about five or six years ago. And I don't really work with architects as much anymore. I am working on a project at the at the moment with some architects, um, but we it's uh, it's we're on a different level. I come in a different level now. Before I used to be more employed as um, you know to to put the narrative in the building and now I, I sort of get involved with the structure on certain things a bit more now so it's a different it's a different place we are, we're at and with AHMM the biggest um, last year after a few years of uh, not working with them partly because schools came to an end they weren't rebuilding schools and stuff um, I did Broadgate and this was a very different uh, um, collaboration where basically I wasn't necessarily enhancing their walls I was putting a big structure in the middle of their architecture um, which for, fortunately has won lots of awards with HMN so that was a great collaboration but it, it's more I come in slightly more as an artist now rather than an enabler on other things if, mm. if that makes sense no. so my collaboration with architects have changed um, okay. over the years and um, we have lots of questions about your, your choice of colours and the vibrancy of colour. Um, you know, you've got the, in the gallery that you know, there's a, a piece with must have about 20 different shades of orange in, on it. You know, so the, the putting one colour against another, is it almost natural or do you have lots of bits of paper where you're painting the different colours and working it out? Well, you will see in the exhibition some of my test colours. So when mm. I was working on the schools years ago, because each school I used to give it a sort of set of colours, you know, and, and I used to have like 300 test pots and I would test all the colours because you've got to be really careful with colour about where the light is coming from because if you get very north light, things change colours a lot, you know. So when you're choosing colours, you've got to really think about where that colour is going to be and is that the right combination of colours. Um, and, and so over time of sort of doing lots of tests, I sort of honed down my, the colours that I liked. And, um, and for a little while I've been using, well, I mean... <laughs> It's quite a lot of colours. It's like 40 colours or something. So it's not like I haven't honed it down to two. But, and all, all the time it evolves and it also depends on what project that I'm working on. And, but if you go back to when I was at St. Martin's, um, I did a big uh, project in my final project and the colours I'm using now are actually very similar to the colours I was using then. So I was always... Um, I, I knew when I was at St. Martin's when everybody was using red, black and yellow because it was a time of constructivism. And I was like going, no, there's secondary colours. Please let us use other colours. You know, so it's always been there. But it's just that what's so brilliant is the world has changed and everybody's letting me do all my colours. And <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So we're going, going back, and I'm happy. <laughs> and, um, going back to St Martin's and your experiences as, as a student, you know, how, you know, what did your degree sort of leave you with and, and what, is, what have you kept from your degree now that, you know, just for the sort of students' uh, interest, really, sort of those degrees always leave a mark on us. Um, yeah, um, well, my first and second year wasn't great and I wanted to leave um, after the second year because um, they had a bit of a, some issues with, we didn't have any tutors, basically. <laughs> and, um, and I wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't really finding that it was really stretching me mentally and I wasn't too sure. And, um, and then I hit the third year and my, tu my tutor was Jeff Fowl and he was he totally turned it around for me. He basically just said, you don't have to do hanky boxes, Morag, you know, <laughs> you can just do anything. You can think of anything. And he, I always, I even said it last week to the group of people that I was talking to at the Adventure Playground. My dad, um, not my dad, um, uh, Jeff Fowle said to me, you know, Morag, you, if you go up there, right up there, you can always come up there. But if you start there, you're only ever going to go down there. And I've always lived by that. I've always gone right up that top, top level <laughs> to try and make things happen. And that was one of the most important things he ever said to me. And then it made me think that anything was possible and I could make anything possible. And, um, and that was, I think that's, what I got through my whole of my education was actually Jeff. He was, he really believed in me and nobody had really believed in me before. And so that, that is very important as a student. I think that, that you get somebody who gets you. Mm -hmm. um, and because I was a bit, you know, I was doing sort of weird things. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to do the posters and stuff like that. You know, I wanted to do other stuff. Um, and he encouraged me, and that was the best thing he could have ever done. Yeah, he's, he's a very, he's got a fantastic reputation and a very inspir inspirational lecturer. Mm. So. And um, we've had a number of questions about um, sort of mental well-being, especially Ella from Fine Art, and um, regarding sort of mental health. And I know the Good In Good Company project, the, the beer that was sold, 50% of the profits went to the... Uh, mental health charities you know have there ever been times in your career where you felt sort of feelings of anxiety or sort of depression and how you've sort of pu pulled through pull through those I yeah I mean I, I feel I, I suffer from massive anxiety all the time and if I say that to people and then they see me speaking they go well you know you you seem very confident and stuff but I don't I have massive anxiety I had to go to the toilet 15 times before we came on tonight <laughs> I, 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 16 I, times. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean I've um when I was when I was really um, when I was doing work, particularly when I was at the Royal College and I wasn't fit, it didn't fit in, you know, I, you know, I was really worried. And I, I think for a long time, I felt like I needed to conform. So maybe I, I maybe ran my studio for longer than I should have done because I thought that that's what I was meant to be doing rather than so when I was at the Royal College, I designed opera sets and um, rather than maybe what I should have been doing. And actually at the end of that, people should have said to me, why don't you go and do theatre design? Or why don't you go and do something like that? Or maybe look at architecture. But no, they just said to me, oh my God, Mark, you're never going to get a job. We've got to find you a job. And, you know, and they all tried to find me a job. And, and then I thought, oh my God, I've got to get a job. And <laughs> so... And then I got a job straight away, the first job I went to. And then, um, and then I, and it was, you know, it was good. I worked for Lamont Shirley. He did the next directory at the time, which was a really big um, job. And he really believed in me as well, which was great. And then I started to teach at St. Martin's with Jeff. And then eventually I decided I wanted to set up my own studio um, because all the boys had set up their studios and none of the girls had done anything. And I was like, well, I want to set up a, you know, I want to do it. <laughs> and um, so there was this poor, uh, 
<laughs> Jane Chipchase, who was unsuspecting from the year below me at Royal College, and we set up to begin with. And, and I think that, it, you know, um, she had different priorities than me. Um, I wanted to buy computers, she wanted to do a bathroom up. So we, we went our separate ways. But I, I sort of went maybe slower doing things because there wasn't a, a structure. So when I set up, there were no, you know, when the boys all set up, they all had their mates and they'd all set up and they were all supporting each other. And then a female setting up, you are on your own. You know, and basically I have been on my own <laughs> for, the, for 30 years. And if you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is going to believe in you. So however hard it gets, whatever people think, you've just got to think, I'm going to make this happen. I am going to make it happen. And I'm going, to, if it's not going that way, you can, uh, you know, that there's a, you know, by the time I was sort of um, running my studio and things, my mum and dad couldn't really help me at that point. You know, I, I had to make those decisions on my own and, and, you know, and I always have done. I've made decisions of buying my property, doing things, you know, how much money I earn. That's all been just me making those decisions. And, and it can be hard and you have to be strong. Yeah. And it isn't easy. No. I, yeah. And do you ever wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat going, oh, Yeah, I wake up all the time in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, of course I do. And I have this, um, I had, a, I think things relate a lot to when you're, a child. So my dad was a, a musician, a session musician, and he did really, really brilliantly, you know, did okay. I mean, um, my dad's priority wasn't necessarily about money, but then when he got older in his fifties or whatever, the, the work ran out and then they had no money. And I watched my mum and dad have no money. And I just decided I've got to earn money as well, <laughs> you know, because I don't want, I, I, I think, well, they, they were very limited because they had absolutely nothing mm. and um, because they hadn't really planned. And so I, I like a balance of, you know, planning. So I've done certain things in my life to make certain things happen. And now I'm at a different stage in my life and I'm doing different things. But mm. I had to make everything happen myself. I had no money from my parents, no money from anywhere. I had to absolutely just make that, you know, make whatever I've got myself sort of thing. And, and, it, and it was hard and I think it's hard now, but I think there's similar, you know, it, if you start from nothing, it's always hard, you know. <laughs> and but then it's very beneficial. Yes, true. It's very true. And over since March, over lockdown, obviously your Instagram feed showed us all that you're redecorating the house, your house, <laughs> and growing things. And obviously, um, what else did you, you know? When you sort of, ha I mean, we did speak the other day, and you know, obviously some of your commissions didn't happen, so that must have been quite difficult. So that time, how did you sort of? frame your time and what type of things did you get up to it was actually a really it was interesting for me because um i have been non-stop i went to um kindergarten when i was 18 months because i didn't want to stay at home with my mum because it was too boring and then since then you know i've never had a break i have never had a stop i have just gone on and on and on like a machine <laughs> So, and then I've been, tra I was traveling a lot. In February, I'd been to India, I'd been to Chile, I'd been, you know, I'd been traveling a lot. So actually, um, the very first lockdown, it was actually interesting because the whole world had stopped and we all had to stop. So we had to change our mindset, you know, it wasn't just making a choice, it was we all were in this together and we had to think. So, um, it gave me more time to reevaluate what I'm doing and um, and find and maybe maybe not just be on this running thing all the time and actually choose more carefully, think about what I did enjoy in the summer. And I did enjoy, you know, taking my dog out for the period of time rather than now we're back to a little bit more of a sort of, moving along and you know and the and the dog's looking at me like take me out take me out <laughs> whereas 
I would give him, you know, that hour every morning and then he would have, whereas now he gets like half an hour and, and, and he's not so happy. So, you know, actually, but now it's too long. It's been yeah. too long now. So that first time, but now it's like, I want it to, I want it to move. Um, but I don't want to use the word normal because I don't like normal because I want us to come back with what we've learned yes. from this period of time and to actually, you know, live our lives in a different way. And, and we, we, you know, we have found different values along mm -hmm. that way. And, um, and I think there's a danger that it's just goes back into what it was mm -hmm. and actually we should learn from, from yeah. this. Time. We've got to go back to better and really try and understand and respect everyone, I think, a lot more. Yeah. We've got a couple of um, questions from the audience. Um, we've got somebody, Rusha from Mumbai. Um, hello, welcome to that you've joined us tonight. Um, and wants to ask about, you know, do you take, how much do you take into consideration climate conditions when, when you're working in and putting up your installation, like weather, uh, weather conditions, I think. So in the in the sense of the materiality yeah i think in the sense of materiality and materials yes yeah i mean you know if i'm working in a different country um i would work with people in that country and we would talk about you know the best materials if it isn't um uh you know if it's a tropical i haven't really done tropical actually um but uh, and actually I'm doing something here now with bamboo, which is interesting because through the winter. So, because I've been wanting to do, I wanted to do bamboo in my project in Hong Kong, but that didn't, that didn't work out. So um, I think the materials I use, I use um, FSC rated uh, marine apply hard, hardwood that is uh, growing in uh, hotter countries anyway, you know, so that wood is made to last in, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, so I would work with the people mm. to... So, local knowledge, yeah. Yeah, yeah, local. And um, another question from Amanda, what is your preferred brand of paint? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hopefully they're listening and then they can give me loads of it. <laughs> but um, no, they have actually, they did. Actually, they did give me loads of it for my project in Brighton. So thank you, Dulux. So oh. thank you, Dulux. <laughs> this is an advert. <laughs> so um, I use, um, outside I use Weathershield Dulux paints and um, because I like painting with them, but there are other brands and are available yes <laughs> and then i use if i can't get some colors so um i use bristol paints who are seen paintings and they give me the really beautiful ultramarines and um you know they're amazing um paints and i mix them up and then if i use those paints i have to give another extra coatings for weather depending you know, depending on where the piece is being used. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so people always ask me and I will always say that my um, neon paints are Bristol paints. So um, they're hard to let, they're hard to paint though. So if you oh. get some and you want to use it, don't ring me about how to use it. <laughs> if you get it wrong, I can't help you. <laughs> and, and, and do you always do you always go to the local paint merchant, or is it all online? Or? No, I, I well, I, I I order usually from brewers because I know them locally, and then yeah, they I I usually put a big order at night, and then in the morning they bring it round to me. So um, yeah, they're nice. But I have uh, Dulux have been really great, and they they have sponsored me as well. So um, I yeah. I mean, lots of people use other paints. I, I just, I'm just <laughs> yeah. happy with you. Personal preference. And um, Sandra is asking, do you ever take on interns? No, I do not take on interns because I'm quite boring and I wouldn't want somebody to hang out with me for ages and ages. Um, but I do um, employ people on if to paint for me if I'm doing a big project. So if I'm doing a big project, I would maybe put a call out and then people can come and help me paint on a project. If it's not 
if it's a if it's a project that I'm being paid for, you know, like an art project, and I'm being paid for, I pay for that. If um, I'm doing another project that's a community community project, then the people who have organised me, they work out whether they pay people or it's a volunteers. But if it's my project, you know, if it's me, like the job in Sweden, you know, I pay people an hourly rate and then they can come and paint with me and I show them, you know, how I pay, you know, how to do it and everything. And I'm there all the time, supervising <laughs> and painting and painting. And so, yeah, so that's, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Esther um, has asked <laughs> quite a poignant question. How, have you any advice on doing an art degree during COVID times? I'd like to know that as well, please. <laughs> wow. Well, I don't teach. So um, if I was a student, you mean, what, how I would do it? I think that's probably, yeah, being online, basically. Yeah, okay. being online, et cetera. That's well, I think that you have to get in the physical, like mm. in the real world, in the real. So how I work is I where I'm sitting at the moment is my computer. I'm probably on there really a lot of the time. And, and to be honest, like I said, I don't want to paint all the time, but I think it's really important to come off the computer, you know, do physical things like painting or building or making structures and then come back on and, you know, or drawing. And then so that you, you, that everything isn't on the screen because I think you become detached you know, I, I, I totally, I am struggling um, with a, a project that I'm doing where, you know, say, for example, you're presenting on Zoom and then everybody switches all their cameras off and you can't read the room. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know how they're responding to you. And whereas if I was normally in a presentation, I'd be in a room with people and I would be able to read that, that person's thinking that, you know, while I'm doing the presentation, I'm also scanning the room, working out who's reacting to that, you know. And then I end up being in a situation where all the cameras are off and then I'm like, well, I don't even know you know, and then somebody gives you a written feedback. You're like, well, I don't really understand that. So I think that wherever possible, even if it's distanced or, you know, whatever, I think it is really important to go in a physical space yeah. when, you're, when you're allowed to and in the right way. And then, and then you know, Zoom things are good for lots of, mm. yeah. lots of that, stuff. Yeah. Thankfully, the studios are open at AUB, so students have been coming and working. Got a question from, from Rebecca. Um, how, is, how has your experience of doing some set design in your formative years affected your work? When I designed my opera sets, yeah. it wasn't really set design. It was just like what I do now, really. It was just <laughs> me doing my thing, you know. No, I, I never spoke to anybody who made theatre sets. Uh, would, you, would, you would you take on a set design? Because that'd be of quite Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would do anything. I, I don't have... Um, I mean, the only big thing that I've got in my head at the moment is I want to build my chrysanthemum house. But otherwise, I'm sort of, I sometimes like when people see what they want me to do. Sometimes I like that. I mean, I've got some projects I want to do myself, but I also like people's vision of what they, they imagine that they, I'd want to do. And usually they're right. I do want to do it. <laughs> and what are those projects that, of the, the chrysanthemum house? What are the projects that you would like to sort of, have for yourself at the minute oh well my chrysanthemum project which i've been going on for years and years now where i want to build because finsbury park um which was my local park as a child um a victorian park you know that and they had chrysanthemum house and the chrysanthemum society lived uh, were around next to it and the and chrysanthemum so there's a whole thing about uh, colour names are, were taken from chrysanthemums as well because there were so many varieties so they started naming the chrysanthemums and then colours were called you know you it was used anyway nomenclature or whatever and um, and and so I just and also what's so brilliant about chrysanthemums is they do actually bloom all year round but they, they were a particular plant that bloomed in the winter and so I just love this idea of uh, and, I, and I've grown them on my um, roof as a test and I've also done a post. I just would love to build this thing that was, you know, a planted coloured thing in the winter that was flowers because you think of flowers more in the summer or, and you don't think necessarily, you might go to other countries and there's 
there's flowers in the winter, but we don't, we tend to sort of close down until spring, don't we? So, you know, to have a fully flat plant flowers from December, uh, from sort of November to February, I think is amazing. So that's the, that's my mission at the moment. Um, and, that be and, to grow, and I've been growing them. Oh yeah, and is that on your... I've drawn a thing, it's like a crazy thing. I wonder if I, no, I haven't got it in my schedule. Yeah, I've drawn this sort of, it would be like a glass house that had flowers on the inside and flowers on the outside, you know, and because often I see my work as um, going to a sort of temporary space and then coming up like a, a flower and then blooming and then disappearing again because it's temporary, you know, and then moving somewhere else. So, um, you know, Plant. And flowers are so amazing, you know, people get so scared about colour and I go look at flowers <laughs> and plants and they have a lot of colour, you know, so we can have colour. Yeah, definitely. And probably one last question now as before we wind up. Um, what was the, what's been the biggest mistake, this is from Sandra, that you've made in your career and how does it become the biggest learning outcome? Oh gosh. Well, of course, have I had any mistakes? Well, oh, that is the key. <laughs> <laughs> Mistake. Or errors, maybe. Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I mean, maybe believing in my own, being confident enough for certain things, I think that maybe for a long time I, I, I was pretty, because I once said to a tutor that I, well, I felt that I wasn't very confident <laughs> and he said that I was always confident and inside I always thought I wasn't confident. Um, I try, I mean, I haven't done a big, I haven't done a big, um, somebody might say or put their hand up and think I had, I can't really remember that I've done a big disaster. No. I, I can't think of that I've done a real disaster. I think that I could have maybe, um, uh, sort of manage things in a different way mm. and and maybe in the past I used to feel that um, I should have stood up for uh, the the odd thing more I think that's the thing I think that's where I've changed now where I feel like um, I will if I absolutely believe in something, I will make it happen by hook or by crook and I will not, you know, and if somebody says no, I need to know the reason why they said no and I need to understand that and then I need to come back with why I think they might be wrong. <laughs> um, and then, you know, yeah. So maybe sometimes, well, I don't know if I answered that, but. No, I think that was a good answer. And, and I'd like to thank you, Morag, for, it's joining us all today. I, I always loved. We well, always love talking with you, and I hope well, everyone in the audience has enjoyed it. And thank you for your support for AUB and your fantastic exhibition, but also the support you give our students as well, which is exceptional. Thank you very much indeed. Well done, Sally. Well done, Morag. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I'm sad the exhibition is coming to an end. And. And Will and Violet and Sally and Paul, I mean, so much support. It's been really brilliant. So thank you so much. And thank you for letting me chat. I always think it's a bit like therapy. I've had a therapy that session. Yeah, well, we, had a good, we had a good old matter the other day that I really enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to talk about those themes today. <laughs> you all feel much better now. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Can I also echo the thanks as well from everyone this evening? Sally, thank you very much for uh, chairing this evening's conversation. Mark, you're inspirational. What more can I say? And you, like so many people, has called your exhibition their hope, their rainbow, their light. So continue spreading that light, that love, and inspiration because everybody welcomed it here. And thank you for getting to what was, what is, and sort of was a hard time. But I think you kind of kept us going with that sort of your inspiration through the exhibition and what you do in general. So again, thank you very much, Sally and Mark. And Paul, thank you again for your welcome address this evening. Um, before I can sign off, um, we we'll just remind you all to follow us on Facebook and social media. We'll have our up, more up and coming events and exhibitions. So we hope that we'll, this will not be our last webinar. Well, there's many more to come because I think we've mastered the technology now. 
So again, thank you all for signing on this evening and making this a really enjoyable event. So from us, thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you.